What's up, everybody? Hey, good evening. Grab a, grab a seat if you're not already down. We're going to get this show on the road. Welcome to A2 New Tech. Um, I'm Ryan Kelly. I've been a host here for, gosh, going on two years now. So um, welcome, everyone. Uh, who's here for the first time this evening, your first A2 New Tech? Love it. Love it. Uh, it's always about 50%. I actually was curious. I ran the numbers on this. So of the 174 people who RSVP tonight, 50% joined the meetup group in 2017, which is awesome. And then another 25% joined in 2016. So uh, I think that's a good sign of growth. So glad you're all coming out. I see a couple like second and third timers here tonight too. So appreciate you coming back. Uh, so this has been running since 2009, just a community organized event. Um, started by a handful of people in this room. Doug Song down here. We've got uh, David up in the up in the corner, and I think that might be about it for this evening. But oh wait, who'd I miss? Oh well, Roger. Well, Roger, gets, Roger gets a special shout out. So um, uh, yes, yeah, so we've done over 100 meetups. Over 300 companies have pitched. Uh, you can think about this event as being almost like a dress rehearsal for an investor pitch. Uh, it's a live audience, so um, everyone. Brings their brings their A game. Um, it's an interesting audience mix too. You get a mix of students, entrepreneurs, developers, people in all different disciplines, uh, curious startup, curious uh, investors. So um, yeah, it's a great opportunity. I'm glad you're all here tonight. Uh, we uh, we've got almost 6,000 members and over 300 companies have pitched to date. Um, and why 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 do we do it other than it's fun to hear the companies pitch? Uh, so I, I found that you know, after five years of being in the, the Midwest, um, that Ann Arbor is super accessible, but it's not always obvious where to meet the people you want to connect with. And online's great, and obviously we all do a lot of that, but it's, it's great to have an opportunity at least once a month. I mean, there's tons of awesome meetup groups, but this one kind of brings together, I think, a, a really uh, neat cross-section of people. So if you do one thing tonight other than enjoy the pitches, meet somebody that uh, you're going to keep in touch with beyond this event, because I guarantee you, you can meet somebody interesting here. Um, a bunch of thank yous. So uh, Dana Thompson, I don't know if she's still in here. She was in just a minute ago. There she is, Dana Thompson. Shout out to her. Uh, she runs the entrepreneurship clinic and uh, the University of Law School, and they have been a very gracious host, uh, giving us their venue here every month, and we really appreciate that. Uh, A2 Geeks, nonprofit dedicated to making Southeast Michigan and Ann Arbor a great place for geeks and creatives to live, work, and play. Roger Rail, Roger Rail down here on the video. He has a company called R2 Vive. He donates his time every month here. And um, you know, if you go on YouTube and search A2 New Tech, you can find every single one of these uh, events, including tonight's live streaming right now. Um, and then uh, our organizers, founders, Doug Song, Zach Steinler, Scott Goshi, David Bloom, and I'm sure I'm missing some others. We're doing pizza again this month, that's right. So uh, Ann Arbor Spark uh, is, a, is a community group here, economic development group, and they are committed to bringing together organizations and individuals to support the growth of companies and creations of jobs. Ben Harrington, the blue shirt, will be taking a head count, and then we'll uh, pies on uh, Spark after, after the event today. Here's the agenda. It'll run till about 8 o'clock here. Um, we have five companies, they each give a five minute pitch and we do five minutes of q and I keep them honest with a timer down here on the laptop and occasionally an obnoxious beep at the end. Um, think about your questions now, if you've read about any of these companies, I'll, uh, and please stand up when I ask questions, I'll call on people so that you can ask whatever you want. And please make it a question. I know commentary is very tempting, but uh, if you can ask your question in the form of a question, that would be awesome. Um, we will also make time for community announcements at the end. And this is open to anyone. If you're hiring, if you're looking for a job. Oh, I, I forgot to do that poll. Who is uh, hiring right now? Any, or your company or anyone who's hiring? All right. Who's looking for a job right now? All right. Well, you're in the right place to, to meet each other. So thanks for coming out. And plug yourself. Plug your company. Um, if you're looking for something very specific, uh, it's, it's all open. If you have another meetup, we'll make time for that. Uh, we always do this the third Tuesday of every every month. The next two months are spoken for, which is awesome for me because I don't have to go like find this, all the pitches each month. 
Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about which, who's going to be up, but if uh, you want to present, you find this or you know somebody who might want to present in the future, organizers at a2newtech.org is the email. And that will go to me and a handful of people, and we'll try to get you in one month. Uh, podcast recommendations. This is my, my special treat for y'all. Um, I don't have any businessy ones or entrepreneurship ones this month. I got some local flair. So who, who's ever heard the AADL's uh, Ann Arbor Stories podcast they put out? This has been going on for a while. Um, I had looked, most recently this was episode 37, which was a mailbag of just random questions uh, about the town that uh, whoever's hosting it is just doing a terrific job. I also really enjoyed episode 30, which is the origin story of the Embassy Hotel, which has a much more interesting history than, than I realized. So go check out Ann Arbor Stories, AADL Ann Arbor Stories. And if you're using iOS, uh, you can see everything I listen to in light on an app called Breaker at BK. Uh, one more digital plug. Uh, so we have a Slack. If you go to maidena2.com slash Slack, that will get you invited uh, into that. And a lot of the people here that are in the audience, you can also connect with there versus email. And with that, Silence your phones if you haven't already. Uh, if you're going to tweet, use hashtag A2NewTech. That's where you find mostly me, face posting pictures of each of uh, our events. But uh, I'll give a shout out to some of the speakers. And uh, I'm pleased to welcome our first speaker this evening, Stan Bradbury from Graffiti. Graffiti brings Snapchat experience to the rest of the internet and allows users to break free from the structured comment section. So let's all give Stan a warm welcome. So my name is Stan Bradbury, and I'm here to talk to you about graffiti. And graffiti intends to change the way that people interact with the internet. So who here likes to snap? Snapchatters. So as you know, as a Snapchatter, when people create content, they hardly ever release that video or image without adding this extra layer of creativity on top of that. They're putting filters on it, they're writing clever captions, they're drawing on it. So they really like this ability to express themselves in a digital format more than just traditional text-based comments. Uh, these Snapchat type tools are so popular that Facebook and Instagram have stolen them and hundreds and hundreds of millions of people use them every day. People also love commenting. So three of the top 11 websites online are commenting platforms. But if you look at commenting platforms, they've hardly changed for 20 years. And they're very text-based, they're very chronological. It's hard for you to get your comment noticed. It's hard for you to discover the comments of people that you're most interested in. So it's a very noisy space. The other thing that's a problem with commenting is it's very siloed. So comments on one platform are not readily accessible by any other platform. And if you are interested in what people are talking about, you have to go platform to platform to try to find those comments. And many websites don't even offer commenting these days because commenting at a certain point got too popular and very noisy. So here's an article from the MLive uh, last week, and within a day, an article that's just about art in town already had 75 comments. So if you wanted to read through those comments, you could, but there may only be two or three comments that are relevant to you. They might be friends of yours or people that you're interested in their opinions. So it's very noisy for you to find the comments that you're most interested in. And if I want to leave a comment on this, I'm left being comment number 76, which is not going to be discovered very easily. Oops. So what we do is we took the regular internet, we added those Snapchat type tools to create graffiti. So now I can leave a comment exactly where I want to on top of that article or photo. And I can be much more creative. It's a multimedia experience and I'm not limited to just the text box comments that are off to the side or way below the article or photograph that are hard to discover. So here I am, I'm surfing the internet and I see that on TMZ that Jersey Shore is going to do a reunion show this summer, so I don't want to be comment number 163. So I hit my little graffiti icon. It's an extension in my Chrome browser. I select the tool that I want to uh, use, which in this case I'm going to drop an image into that article. 
I'm going to drag it to right at the exact, exact point in that article that I want my comment, my image in this case, to appear, and then I decide how I'm going to publish it. In this case, I'm going to automatically load it to my Facebook profile so my friends can see it. I'm also going to publish it to the internet so that anyone else who has the Chrome extension will see the graffiti potentially that I left behind. So as you surf the web, you don't see all the graffitis that might be associated with that URL. You have your own personal filters, so you may only see graffiti that is from your friends on Facebook, people that you follow that might be celebrities or political figures, or top-rated graffiti or most recent graffiti. So even if there's four graffitis that might match your filters, you're just going to see those four one at a time, much like Snapchat stories, so you're not overwhelmed with graffiti with the same article. So graffiti allows you to break through all those silos. All your comments come into one central location where you can curate them. But more importantly, if you're following artists, celebrities, political figures, your friends on Facebook, if they're also with graffiti, you can see all their commenting across all media properties as well. At the end of the day, you end up with a very centralized and socially connected kind of commenting architecture it filters out a lot of the noise. You can still go look at all those comments in depth if you want to. And if you try to broadcast your comments, you're much more likely to be seen by people that are important to you. Obviously, it's a huge market, um, many billions of dollars. Right now, the desktop advertising market is still $36 billion, which is where we're starting with uh, browser plugins. Our advertising model is uh, display advertising on profile pages, but also a new commercial graffiti model which is, if I'm shopping for shoes, we're going to allow a competitor potentially to put an ad right on that and save me $25, and I'm going to go there and buy the shoes. It's all my time, but I'll gladly take questions. All right. Good job. So the graffiti icon will pop and show you a number if there's any matching graffitis. So you have to be on that page already. Yeah, when you browse to that page, it'll show you the matching graffitis. But if you follow artists, you can go to their graffiti page, just like in Twitter, you can see the entire history of Taylor Swift. Anytime she graffitis, it'll be summarized in her own profile page. Well, more or less, if you go to your profile page, you can see the people that you follow, and then you can drill down on each of those people that you follow to see their graffitis. What stage is the company, and what's like the next big milestone? We're launching the MVP in a couple of weeks, and we will post to this uh, meetup thread when that happens. So one of our asks is that you download the extension and try it hopefully at least 20 times and post it to Facebook so we can start to see the viral characteristics of graffiti. And uh, I'll also post my contact information so that you can give us feedback. But it, the front end is all working. We're just cleaning up a few things on the back end right now. If uh, people do a graffiti on the same page, am I going to see both of them at the same time? No, time's out. Um, so if they both match your filters, it's chronological. So whoever graffiti it first, It'll show up first, it'll run for a set period of seconds, just like Snap Stories. And you can double click on it to dismiss it and go to the next graffiti so you don't have to wait the full time if you don't want to. Is it just in Chrome, the filter? Or the, the MVP app? is only Chrome browser, which is 60% of the desktop marketplace, but hopefully soon we'll roll out across all desktop browsers. Can you explain the reaction of advertisers that you've seen being able to advertise on the competitors' websites? Well, graffiti is meant to be subversive. That's mm -hmm. our yeah, I know. answer. I, I think it's a good thing, actually. But also, when you look at other extensions that are out there, like Honey, so that's an extension that when you're shopping, it will actually tell you about coupons or discounts associated with what you're shopping for. Uh, when you look at, uh, there are extensions that do comparison shopping, so it's looking at what you're looking for, and it will actually go look at other websites simultaneously and do a drop down and show you comparison shopping. So we're not really fundamentally that much different from what those services are doing and they've had no problem. We're certainly less intrusive 
than ad blockers, which are actually taking revenue away from content publishers. And in a way, I think content publishers will like this more because we're keeping that conversation on top of their website as opposed to a third-party website like Reddit or Twitter. So most of the time, we're going to add traffic, add time on these publisher websites. And you know, there is the risk that if you're not competitively priced, you might lose the business. So you said the ads have the ability to click through to, the, to buy the item? Yeah. Do you intend to have hyperlinks available to users at some point as well? Like if, you, if I put it in my graffiti, you click through yeah. and find me? There's going to be two types of graffiti. You have to be a Facebook user and register with Facebook to do personal graffiti. We're going to closely monitor it because we don't want it to become like Twitter, which is spam bots and garbage, and we don't want it to be like Snapchat, which is sexting. Um, so if you, if you abuse graffiti, you'll get kicked out, and then you won't be able to use that Facebook profile again. Individual users will be able to link out and do anything they want. There's really no limit to what you can do with graffiti as an individual user. Commercial accounts will have to pay for pay-per-click advertising, um, and we'll closely monitor that as well. I want to follow up to one of the questions earlier. Like, what, how will you know, and when do you expect to know if this is getting traction, right? Like, how long is your sort of runway for this, and, and what are you what are you hoping is the next like traction milestone? Well, when we launch the MVP next month, we hope to get to tens of thousands of users, but more important is you can't buy your way to the top in a social media experiment. You have to have viral characteristics, and we have to, we won't know what those viral metrics are until we're actually out there. If we look at the history of Snapchat, in the early days, they spent zero or near zero on advertising. That was all word of mouth. And that even within the first two years, it was 84% referrals and only 4% were actually paid people. So if we can get that 10 to 1 or 20 to 1 kind of viral characteristic with our early adopters, then we'll know whether you know, this is really going to be a multi-million user kind of platform or just a vanity project. Great, great, great questions, everyone. All right, thanks for much. Right, so moving right along. So yeah, I always tell presenters to have an ask here, and uh, whether it's money or introductions or users, and I think clearly stands as users and uh, getting as many people as possible to tell tell about this. So I look forward to seeing that. All right, next up, this uh, paper. Okay, we have Liberty Street. Uh, so Yuji uh, Fuji, Fujikawa uh, is going to be presenting. Liberty Street is building an app that helps foreigners enjoy traveling in Tokyo. I like a very targeted beachhead market, so I'm interested to hear about this one. Let me hand you the mic. Okay. Kick us off. So uh, my name is Yuji Fujikawa. I'm from Japan. I'm actually learning at the Ross School uh, and studying business right now. And uh, we're here to uh, introduce our new uh, mobile app called uh, Tokyo Quest, which is about uh, um, application to show around Tokyo. So um, I think many of you might have been to Tokyo. So we, do you guys have been to Tokyo? Yeah? Yeah. So I think you guys know how Tokyo is a great city. And I, I want everybody to explore more, so that's one of the reasons why we came up with this idea. And I think many of you, when, when you went to Tokyo, I think you used the, the um, uh, internet site like Google, um, like TripAdvisor, Yelp. And many people, I think, enjoyed it, but I think you might have had some difficulties finding the right answer or the right place to go at the right timing. And we did some survey among our um, colleagues or the students, and many of the people have the same kind of uh, difficulties. And that is like how to deal with the time consuming preparation and also the language barrier. So like for example, like when you're going to like Tokyo, um, say if you're using the trip advisor and looking for like the, the restaurants and stuff, uh, it's so hard to find the right answer or the, the information from these sources. So if you just click on to each restaurant, you wouldn't know what the, the, the information that you're looking for. So like for example, you wouldn't know until you click on it. 
that you're looking for. And that's the one of the thing that has the problem. Another one is like quality. This is the, the map from the Google. So I typed in um, the restaurant in Google and then searched it. And what came up is this is the beef bowl um, rice uh, restaurant chain, which is like very cheap. It's not like nice or decent restaurant, but it came up four. So this is not something that you're looking for, I think. And we want to solve this, so, uh, give a, come up with a solution to um, solve this problem. So we came up with some summary of what's happening right now is that I think there's complicated searching process. So once you go to each uh, site, you have to customize your information and central, uh, centralize by yourself. And that's a lot of time that you're spending on it. So if, we, if, we, if you uh, could use our application, you could reduce the time, uh, which means like our, our application would come up with the um, interest matching um, to you, and also with the tr following up the trend uh, in just one application. And we're thinking about coming up with the centralized user interface. And another milestone that we have on the back of this system is when travelers register their interests, that goes into our system, and we're going to be uh, hiring some global associates, which is, could be the college students and translators. And this is one of the key that we have, we think is the strong, because in Japan, there's so many people who could not speak English, and there's only limited people who could um, find the English information. So if these college students and translators could um, do the screening of the information through blogs and SNS and media, we could um, bring the, the right information for the foreign for, uh, tourists and then bring it to the uh, right time. And then this will be um, secured by the feedback and that will go back to our uh, global associate as an evaluation. So we think we can keep the uh, level at uh, high quality level information for going forward. So our business model will be mainly from the uh, getting the advertising fee from the travel business firms. So initially we will be getting some booking um, service fee but the second stage, we're, we're going to get the uh, fee from the travel business firms. So we're thinking about getting to the market by three steps. Uh, trial will be 2017, and then the prototype 2018, and then getting to the market in 2019 by um, using the uh, um, travel agent. Okay. So um, just going back to the little bit of the back data, the Japan, um, the visitors increasing significantly this past five years and it's going to be more in 2020 which the Tokyo Olympics is going to be held. Well, I'm time up so I'll <laughs> stop it right here. Great. <laughs> yeah, Globally, but we do have a uh, competitive advantage in Tokyo, so we would like to start off from Tokyo. Yes, yeah. Thank you. But but do you think that it'll expand in globally this kind of a uh, uh, application? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I would see like language. It looks like it's your biggest like thing here because I've been to Tokyo. And, like mm. just having a, I would ask people on the street, hey, can you type in your favorite place? Right. So I would think if you can figure out that language component of your city, you might have to. Yeah, yes, yes. I would like to consider that as well. Awesome. What do you anticipate being um, the most, I know, your first like big hurdle of the business? Because clearly you have a lot of tech, you have a lot of vision. What are you, um, I don't know, what keeps you up at night right now? Um, so one of the, the key issues that hiring the people is one thing. Uh, we do have the right um, network, so we do have strong um, alumni network in Japan and also the, the Ross people as well. So 
um, I think this one hurdle. And yeah. the other one is about our user interface. So we haven't had the right uh, engineer uh, in our team yet. So we need to hire someone that will just help us. And also, like um, going back to our uh, presentation, but we're thinking about centralizing our information into one user interface. Mm -hmm. And how we do that is when you like go into the blogs, when you touch the screen, we want to have that um, you know selection to go back into the map. So map will be like you know marked up. So when you go into Tokyo the markup will come up using this GPS. So you, you don't have to read anything because normally the um, street displays is not like supplemented by the alphabet. So you we would not be able to read it. But if you have the GPS you know, marked, marked there, you can just walk through like right and left and then GPS would you know, lead you to the place. How has the business been capitalized today? So uh, once people started to use them, I think the, the travel agency... Well, um, I mean, like, you're like the startup. Like, how's the startup been funded so far? You're, you're hiring people. Have you guys... So we, we are also looking for the investor as well. Okay. Yeah, the thing is, we're aiming to, you know, expand it through uh, Tokyo Olympics. So we're trying to um, expand it quickly. Yeah. Question. I was just wondering uh, how, how other competitors, either through apps, um, through Apple App Store, or like what, what other Yes, um, so there are some Tokyo applications, you can look it up, but um, it's not really customized, or it's not selected um, following the trend. So uh, we didn't include the apps here because there's no significant uh, competitor, but normally um, those information doesn't follow the trend. And we think that one of the trend is very important because um, when you look at the Japanese tour, the foreign tourists, um, half of them are actually Asians. And they're coming back again and again. So they're the repeaters. So once you go to the milestone um, visit, visiting places, you have to you know, follow the trend. Otherwise, it's going to be the boring you know, tour. So we're trying to get the repeaters coming again and again. Through, and then if they use our application, we will have more data coming up, and then we could um, customize those data using the maybe big data analysis and also the f features, the AI as well. Yes? Are you getting funding from any like, uh, tourist bureaus or tourist associations that are trying to promote tourism? Um, not yet. And we, once we get the prototype, we would like to access the, um, those uh, institutions as well. But do you think we should access it this timing? Uh, sorry, I'm asking. I think, I think if you're promoting tourism, you're promoting businesses, there's probably, I know in Michigan there's like hotel associations for certain cities that are trying to get tourists to come to the city and you could pitch it as you know, this is a helping mechanism and have them provide you at least some initial funding for that. Thank you. That is all the time we have for questions. This, I, everyone will be around later too, so if you wanted to ask something, find them at the end. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next up, Unison. We have Mo Ahmed. Unison helps companies make social impact a fundamental part of what they do. Find them on Twitter at, at, at get in Unison. that we've made over the past 18 months. Uh, from a high-level perspective, uh, we're an enterprise software company um, serving the corporate responsibility function for um, very, very large companies. And we realize that this is a topic that um, a lot of people uh, haven't spent a lot of time thinking about, so a little bit of context here. So if I told you that um, 
in some of the developing markets in the world where issues like sanitation, for example, um, you know, are just widespread uh, throughout those regions. And some of the initiatives to tackle those, uh, uh, those issues like sanitation, um, you know, have actually been driven by business. Um, it might be a surprise. Um, when people think of social impact, they think of nonprofits, they think of universities, they think of uh, government programs in many cases, but the corporation is not necessarily um, a, a sort of a, a popular vehicle to drive social impact. But we think that needs to change. Um, this particular program that we've highlighted was, uh, uh, was created and run by Unilever uh, for, for a long time, and I believe it's still active actually. Um, but one of the most effective um, programs to address the issue of sanitation in, uh, in India uh, for, uh, for a number of years. And if you think about it, corporate responsibility has really um, started to go through this process of institutionalization. Um, issues like financial literacy, uh, homelessness, uh, lots of different environmental initiatives, um, corporations are actually spearheaded. And a lot of folks say that as a business model, um, this is the competitive uh, advantage that can actually help businesses differentiate themselves uh, from others uh, in their marketplace. Nowadays, you see headlines like this uh, very often. Um, Salesforce has um, become pretty well known for its initiatives around racial equality. Um, you know, Starbucks has had a number of social impact initiatives very, very embedded into the business. Um, and, and we think that there's going to be more and more of these kinds of stories. So you might be wondering, uh, these all seem like good things, what's the problem? Um, well, what's happened for the corporation um, over the past couple of decades is that um, really because of how uh, easily information is trans transferred uh, from one place to another, um, you know, all of the various different stakeholders uh, around companies um, now have much more of a say in the corporation uh, than they used to have. Uh, a lot of people characterize this as the shift from shareholder theory uh, to stakeholder theory, and that employees, investors, regulators, uh, different partners around the business are starting to play a more active role uh, in how companies are run. Uh, and, and frankly, corporations have struggled to keep up. Um, you know, despite there being a corporate responsibility function uh, at more than two-thirds of the Fortune 500 today, uh, the workload, because uh, the workload that they have has just dramatically increased. It used to be just environment, health and safety programs. Uh, it then grew to governance, risk and compliance programs, uh, including philanthropy and community relations uh, as well. So, so our company has built a platform, uh, as I said, that we launched about 18 months ago uh, to help make corporate responsibility easier to manage. Uh, from a high level perspective, we're doing a few things around the product. Um, a big part is informing the business, um, what different people inside and outside of their company, uh, how they're feeling about the corporate responsibility initiatives and include that uh, as part of the feedback loop. Uh, you might have seen large companies creating different uh, corporate responsibility reports. Um, they're, very, they're usually very long and nobody uh, uh, likes to read them, but, but those do exist. Uh, and then there's the measurements of it. Um, how can we actually use um, analytics to help um, really uh, relate these initiatives back to the financial performance of businesses. All of those things are being facilitated uh, through our platform, which we call the Corporate Responsibility Cloud. Uh, another way to think about it is that we're really just centralizing data collection, uh, workflow management, and reporting uh, for corporate responsibility as a business function. Um, and then another kind of metaphor that we have to describe the kind of platform that we actually have is that it's sort of the middleware between the infrastructure of, of, uh, that large companies have and a lot of the vertical applications that they use uh, specifically for, uh, for corporate responsibility. Um, so far, we've uh, been working with a number of corporations. Uh, we're excited to, uh, to report that. I mean, in 18 months, we've been able to grow um, pretty much to the amount of capital that we've raised, uh, which is about a uh, million dollars. Uh, so we're excited about that. We're in two locations right now, uh, here as well as Washington, D.C., and uh, looking to expand globally next. Thank you. Perfect.
Uh, so it's a pretty kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, business development process. Um, you know, we've identified about a thousand companies that have uh, uh, sort of distinct corporate responsibility functions. We're calling them, we're emailing them, we're even direct mailing them. But that's how we get to them. So name, you know all the names of your customers? That's right. Have you met uh, Marina von Neumann Whitman here at U of M? No. So she invented CSR back in the 60s and 70s. She was uh, on the basic of the public boards of every major multinational in the U.S. J.P. Morgan, Chase Manhattan, GM. She was GM chief economist for 20 years. Served Nixon, you know, uh, during that administration. But uh, she taught actually CSR both at U of M's uh, uh, Ford School of Public Policy as well as the V School. But she knows everybody <laughs> in the space. And she lives here in Ann Arbor. She retired after. At, Right, old age of two after many years, and she's basically just hanging out. But she knows a ton of people because um, she she basically built all that stuff. But at any rate, uh, you should yeah, definitely chat with her if you don't have a. Um, what was her name again? Marina von Neumann Whitman. She's she grew up with Einstein. She's the daughter of John von Neumann, who invented digital logic, uh, ran the Manhattan Project. Uh, <laughs> She has a great autobiography, if people haven't read it, it's called The Mar March's Daughter, published by University of Michigan Press, but she is one of the most amazing women in the 20th century. Can you say that again, please, because I can't hear Marina von Neumann Whitman. Um, it's just literally up on uh, Wikipedia. What was that book? We'll have Doug put it on the comments on the meetup. Yeah, The Martian's Daughter. Yeah. More questions here. Oh, so what are you asking for? What are you here for? Yeah, so, um, this slide. Um, so uh, right now one of our big focuses is hiring. Um, it's been really, really hard to hire uh, enterprise uh, software sales reps uh, in the area, not just because of uh, increasing competitiveness, but just because it requires a, a very sort of traditional kind of uh, enterprise sales rep. And, uh, and a lot of the really, really talented guys uh, nowadays are joining companies like Duo, so um, so we <laughs> we're having a little bit of difficulty there. But so we're recruiting a lot, um, not just for sales, but also engineering as well. Um, and um, and just like Doug said, I mean, a lot of folks that have spent time in in the CSR uh, space, either as academics, practitioners, uh, or whether they run these programs uh, at large companies, um, obviously feedback from them is. Uh, very, very valuable, so we're looking for that as well. So what's your platform underneath? Is it running on an Oracle database or something like that? Or? Uh, so it's not a very sophisticated product. Um, I mean, it's, it's effect effectively a, um, think about it as a, uh, the front end is, is essentially just a workflow management platform. So you see a lot of like forms and a lot of rule systems and things like that on the front end. And you know, all the data that we're collecting uh, from enterprises is stored in a very, very simple um, AWS S3 um, you know, storage system. Um, so from a technological standpoint, uh, nothing that we're building is at the rocket science level, um, but it's really the application of um, you know, data automation and reporting tools for corporate responsibility that I think makes it interesting. Can I ask a follow up to that? Like, what, what keeps somebody else out uh, from doing the same things you're doing if there's not a big technical moat? Nothing. Um, I mean, I don't think that there's anything stopping Salesforce from getting into this business, or Oracle from getting into this business, or Microsoft from getting into this business. Um, and to a certain degree, they have. Um, but it's usually on very, very focused things like workplace giving or workplace volunteering or very specific things around greenhouse gas reporting for environmental initiatives. Uh, but what we're doing is we're building like the infrastructure for a business function. Um, so it's literally like Salesforce is to sales, uh, Unison's CR cloud is to corporate responsibility departments. So we haven't seen other companies necessarily take that position. Uh, one last question. I haven't seen. If you could just address a little bit about the market size and what's your business model? Yeah. So I mean, right now we could look at it. Um, you know, the initial market is probably <coughs> Fortune 100. Is probably what we're going after right now. These are the organization uh, organizations that have hundreds of thousands of employees. Um, they're operating in you know multiple countries with multiple languages. Um, they have a number of programs that they're running. One of our 
Uh, one of the organizations that we're working with has like 50 programs, deploying $500 million every single year. Um, so, you know, the largest organizations probably have the greatest need uh, to begin with. Um, but another way to look at it is anyone that Salesforce can sell to from a sales perspective, we can probably sell to. Um, and anyone who's buying, you know, Oracle databases, as an example, um, probably is also of the size that we can work with them. So it's, it's, it's a large market, but we're initially starting with uh, probably the Fortune 100, then the Fortune 500, and then the other. And, and how do you charge for it? The second part of that question, I think, what was the yeah. pricing model? Yeah, so um, I guess we, one of the benefits of being the first company, I mean, there are way more challenges than benefits, but one of the few benefits of being the first company in a category is that we don't really have a comparison point. So, I mean, it's software, but we don't really have high data costs or anything like that. So we've kind of been trying to price to value. I mean, we think we're saving a lot of time for, uh, for corporate responsibility departments. So on average, corporate responsibility departments are spending six figures a year on this. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Shifting gears to something a little more technical. Uh, Yang Park is going to tell us about the verdict project. Um, Verdict is an interactive C resource efficient query processor with a very efficient description as well. Hi, uh, my name is Yong Ju and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Michigan here at the Computer Science Department. And uh, we are developing an open source project. Which, uh, or, I'm sorry. We are developing an open source data analysis project which, uh, which you call Verdi. And uh, it's under uh, Apache 2.0 uh, Apache 2 license, so you can just download and use it. So, okay, let's get started. Um, so they come here. Look. Uh, I need to drive it from the keyboard. Oh, there it goes. Okay. So whatever company you're running, data analytics is really important to you. Seeing like several companies mentioned that they are collecting data and they're gonna analyze the data. And we, after collecting those data, you can answer several um, like a business intelligence questions. For example, you can answer what are the best selling products for each demographics. Or you can say like what products are ordered together frequently, or how are the important factors that impact your sales. Also, you can uh, use a data analytics for analyzing lots of other types of data as well. So, but the problem is that even today, data using the data analytics systems can be extremely slow. And like so some people mentioned that there are like in-memory database systems or like a columnar database formats, but if you try to actually download and try to use them, then you will experience that. Uh, using those systems are really slow and like, take lots of time. And there are several reasons why still, even today, the, those, uh, those database systems are slow. The first reason is that uh, like, uh, uh, the amount of data we're collecting is growing faster than the uh, computational power. So actually, you're trying, to you're trying to analyze or process all the data, then it'll take more and more time. And the second reason is that like, modern systems are like, highly distributed, so they, are, are, like, they involve like, lots of inefficiencies in like serializing the data or copying the data across the, like, uh, across the network. And also, computational power itself is growing really fast, but uh, there is like a significant gap between the processing power and the like, memory bandwidth. So this, that's something called memory wall, and that's kind of factor that's slowing down the data analytics systems. And also, lastly, so even if you have a, a cluster, so you're, you're not the only user who are using the, your cluster. There are like a, uh, several users or many users who are using your cluster concurrently. So that kind of uh, factors uh, limit your resource, your effective resource you're using. So Verdict is our system. Like we developed this system to solve those issues. So Verdict is basically a SQL-based uh, query processor. And Verdict can bring like a massive speed of 100 times or, uh, to the 200 times speed of by sacrificing only 1% accuracy. And the nice feature about the Verdict is that Verdict does not require any changes to your existing database system, so you can just plug in our software on top of your existing cluster and start to use it. So we already support Apache Spark and uh, Cloud and Impala and Apache, uh, Apache Hive, and we are trying to add a driver for the Amazon Redshift as well. 
So this is possible because uh, uh, we are uh, like a, uh, leading a lab in this field, like a big data analytics, sort of approximate computer processing. The basic uh, theory about the approximate computer processing is that to a in order to answer uh, some like a common data analysis queries, you don't have to process all the data. You can give like a pretty accurate answer by analyzing like, a tiny fraction of the data. So that's the basic uh, ideas about the approximate computer processing. And we are the first uh, system that provides this uh, mobile architecture as uh, uh, like AQP as a middleware. So we are the first system that works on top of the existing uh, software stack. So of course, so there are like a challenges, technical challenges. We have to handle like a, a complex queries, but like a verdict is the um, uh, product that provides the solution to those issues. So let me show you a uh, demo of the actual working system. So in this demonstration, I'm going to compare a uh, existing system, which is which I'm going to show on the left side, and our system. So this data set is basically about 100 gigabytes of data set uh, distributed across the uh, cluster with the uh, definition system of three nodes. And uh, right, and this is like a database schema. If you take if it like a uh, database class system, then you can easily understand that. But basically, it's uh, like uh, it's showing the uh, relationship between your tables. And then, um, the system I'm going to run on the left side is something called Apache Impala, which is one of the most efficient uh, system. And we are uh, running on top of Impala. So we are not changing any uh, existing Impala software architecture. So this is a uh, big data. So uh, let me run this query only once. And this is basically uh, running the basically count query on the, uh, your uh, on my uh, 100 gigabytes data set. So it will take about a, uh, one minute to finish the query. But if we run the same query, basically, uh, I'm sorry. Um, right, so it's supposed to be run much faster, but it's getting the same, almost the same answer uh, almost immediately because we are processing like a uh, lot of like a small size of data, but giving almost the same answer. You will see that the answer, if the answer comes up on the left side, then you will see that the answer is exactly the same actually. So not only like a simple query, we can also like run some interesting analytics. Like uh, basically, we are in this. Question: We are uh, answering what times of the day uh, most more orders are placed. So in this example, uh, Impala takes uh, about 20 seconds to run process security, but well, it took about only two seconds. So in this case, we are achieving a 10 times speed up. And for the next question, I can analyze what products were most popular over the weekend. And so let me run this query. So. So this is like a complex SQL query, full query. So we are not doing any like uh, simple things. But right. showing that you can see that the answer returned from the like entire data set on our database system is almost a look the same, but our system is much faster. Uh, and in this case, we are achieving about like more than 100 times speed up. Yeah, there are other examples too, but uh, I'll like stop showing. Live, live demo. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Yeah, so a, a lot of times, this is a relational database, and a lot of times relational database query times are based on how the data is originally partitioned, and if you use a different query, you have to pre-partition the data to get a good speed. So, I mean, did you account for any of that in, um, in this? No, so in this case, data is just distribu equally distributed over the, like, a multiple uh, HFS, uh, how to distribute the file system. So there is no like partitioning of data because in this case we are processing all the data. Maybe I'm not answering the question. Like how the, or, the data is organized in the database can, can drastically change your, your query speed. Okay, and, and another question is just, uh, can you guarantee the accuracy? So when you say you're 1% accurate, right, right. it needs to be um, 0 to 5. Give me a second. Actually, if you look at the actual data, then it's also have like an error bound on the query answer. So those are mathematically rigorous error bars saying that you're? Yeah, so these are the probabilistic error bounds. 
So in like 95% of chances, these error bounds are both. So your true answer is within a certain error bound. And we provide that information together okay. with the approximate answers. So if you don't like the approximate answers, if you don't think the approximate answers are good enough, then you can of course run the uh, same query on the like a larger data set, then you'll get more answers. Yeah. So, uh, I'll take up here first. You first. Okay, so just want to throw this in. What are the top uh, applications and use cases you think will benefit from this? Um, okay, so actually, we. Um, where's my slides? So, several companies actually showed interest in using our system. So, uh, we got contact from the Google and Facebook. And actually, we are in the process of delivering our products to some custom science company called Donami and another company does core. So they are collecting data and they want to analyze the data. But if you are collecting like 100 gigabytes of data almost every day, then like uh, analyzing those, like uh, running a single query takes a significant amount of time. So what people usually do is just run a single query and it, it's gonna take like 10 minutes. So you're gonna like uh, talk to your colleagues and like, uh, go outside the office and have a cup of coffee and come back. But we don't want you to like waste time on that. So if you use our system instead, then you can just get the answers almost immediately. So you don't like uh, we don't block our like a sort process. You can just continuously export the data. That's the main benefit so using this system. Yeah. So, so you said that you guys are the first uh, APP middleware, but there have been other companies that have been basically SQL for NoSQL. Um, right. So like all the all the like products I mentioned earlier, like the Spark or uh, like Power, they're basically like, in that domain, like the SQL and NoSQL. There is like a, like a debate or the wars between them. But we are not touching any of them. So we are just working on top of them. Right. So Amazon acquired a company. Out of you of them, there's a fellow, an eight banker who built a company called Amiato. Okay. Amiato was a Y Combinator company probably four or five years ago. They were acquired up to me by, by Amazon, but they were basically building approximate uh, query because their whole point was the same thing. Like take something like HFS, unstructured data, provide basically. Um, you know, to toward a specific application, which is actually A-B testing, because that's where, you know, they, yeah, they, they, they didn't right. have... So, sort of I'm aware of, uh, I mean, I didn't hear about you know, that, that one, but I'm aware of that, like, uh, Facebook also has their own system called the Facebook Presto, and... Uh, how Amazon does it? So, if you look at the example, I'm just going to have things like Redshift and all this other stuff, but the office company, probably too soon, because otherwise it would have been, you know... Thing. I mean, I think it's a great thing that, like, more, like, a big players are uh, paying attention to AQP or the proximity processing, but we are, like, a, a leading uh, lab in the academia, so we are the, like, a people who are, like, driving this uh, innovation, basically. So we are, like, developing all the tech underlying complex techniques, and they may, like, uh, read our papers and adopt some techniques. So we are not against their adopting our techniques as well. So because we are open source project, they can just yeah, use our products. Yeah, it was an earlier generation, but there's a lot of folks out of PhD out of Stanford. Uh, yeah, so basically my advisor got like uh, his job at UMH after like doing some AKP works, earlier works, and uh, we are continuing that. So yeah, one of the reasons why I started this project, early project, is because uh, early, all, all, all the earlier projects have like a tightly integrated with existing systems because, for example, if you want to like Amazon thing, then that will require you to install all the like Amazon stack uh, without like, a, you can't use like a Google software in that case. But our, uh, our software does not require that. So you can, yeah. So some more other companies are, you know, Amiata was acquired quite early, but are there other competitors right now that, you know, are, are things that, you know, uh, um, I only know, like, uh, like uh, prototypes or the, like, more of, like, a research works, but I don't know, like, uh, real, like, uh, fully full-fledged uh, uh, commercialized software, AQP softwares. So the reason why it's uh, hard to implement AQP is that it requires, like, a significant change in the underlying uh, database system. So, for example, it's very hard for Oracle to adopt the technique itself within, like, within their system because they have to change all the like query planning or the query processing things. So we are providing a different approach. We can we are just providing this a solution on top of them. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Like whatever whatever database systems you're using, we can just work on top of them. So whether like a data is stored in Amazon S3, you can we can just pull the data from that. It doesn't matter. So last question, an easy one for you, hopefully. What do you want from this group? What are you, what are you looking to um, communicate here, other than you're doing some great stuff? Yeah, so I wanted to let the local people know that we are like uh, developing uh, our software, and we already presented it in a couple of other venues, and we also 
um, hiring too because I mean we need a, like a lot of developers too like to develop all the like front end or the internal like database engines. So yeah, so we are like a, uh, like a people. So yeah, it would be great if you can join us. Great, thank you for coming. Out. Uh, it was uh, terrific. I hope you like the variety of technical and business uh, pitches that you're hearing tonight. All right, our cat for the evening, <clears throat> Jay Patel from Safe Whistle, is going to tell us about their solution for anonymous encrypted corporate whistleblowing. And I believe they just launched this very recently. Did I get that right? Yes, uh, Friday. <laughs> very recently. <laughs> Yeah, so honestly, this is my first pitch. Uh, we did, we're at a very rapid rate. We finished it, pitching today. Uh, I'm just really grateful to be here. If a year ago, if you would have asked me, would I be pitching a company here? Probably not, but here I am. So, uh, woo! Yeah, thank you. So, safewhistle.com, um, our application is Safe Whistle. So, I work a lot in quality management systems, and there's a new standard coming out that requires anonymous whistleblowing for automotive companies, and that's where this whole journey started. So Safe Whistle is an, is, is an encrypted, anonymous, corporate whistleblowing solution. So what is our purpose? To drive employee engagement, change the way employees and corporations manage their whistleblowing process from fear, and maybe you know, we'll consider it to safe, free, and effective actions. And we want to position ourselves to be the gold standard in whistleblowing out there. So what's the problem right now? Uh, employees lack an anonymous platform to raise concern without, cons without potential corporate persecution. So people are, are afraid of whistleblowing because they may get blackballed or um, just some type of persecution. And the anonymous systems right now are antiquated, i.e. hotlines and physical drop boxes. So we've looked at companies that have anonymous hotlines and phone booths in the corner of the factories, or they have a drop box or they have an anonymous terminal where you can file complaints. All those, one way or another, you can get caught doing that and be known as the person who's whistleblowing. So why now? Uh, you know, a safe ways of whistleblow is becoming very, very obvious that it is needed. And some of those examples are Uber, Wells Fargo, and GM. Like, the GM ignition switch issue was known by many engineers, but they didn't have a way to communicate that to upper management. Um, and the thing is, everybody has a reporting device now, so we don't need hotlines, or we don't need a call anymore, or we don't need paper anymore. We can use our smart web-enabled devices, and again, as I mentioned, the IATF, or automotive requirement that is coming out. So the, what is the market size? It's not too big, not too small, just right to make it interesting. So the product, Safe Whistle. Uh, why? It's a, we, develop trust because it's a third party application. So let's say Uber, if Uber was to use it, they never see the data. It's completely anonymous. So the person reporting it, we scrub all that data so we have really no idea where and who is reporting it. Uh, it's private, nobody can see the data. So the database is encrypted as well, not even us. And it's applicable to really any industry, automotive, hospitality, healthcare, elder care and pretty much anything that requires a feedback loop. So our encryption, it's a 256-bit encryption. I, I don't know what really all this stuff means, but I'm learning as maybe you guys are, I, I'm learning right now by fire. Uh, Multi-stage encryption, cracking resistance. So basically it would take to get a report that many centuries right now with the co computational power that we have right now and if they really wanted to get one, it would take a massive global array one year to hack in and get a report. So what is our business model? Right now we're targeted towards large automotive companies. We plan to charge per employee per year and that price is yet to be determined. So what is our ask right now? Oh, I should show you guys this, right? So this is our website, how it works. 
So initially a, per, initially a person comes to safewhistle.com, each company is given a, a code, they enter the code, some subjective line to verify that this is for this particular company, and they go ahead and report it in this report. Once it's, once it's reported, the person who's doing the investigation can follow up because once I report it, I'm given another key code, which I can go back to the website and kind of talk with the investigator. And the administrator or the investigator has an inbox and they can track the status of all of the instances and know who touched when because we have a timeline on it. So our ask is so first we need to name our icon, our bird. We don't have a name for him yet. Name our bird. Uh, we're looking for automotive related connections. We want two or three organizations to beta test it and uh, names of HR executives to pitch and get feedback. So, any questions? Two. Um, do you roll your own crypto or are you using some established crypto? Uh, we're using our own. Huh? Yeah, oh, you're using your own? Okay. And second question. Um, how are you dealing with um, many organizations? I guess some of the fear that comes to my mind is I've got your app on my phone. I'm using your Wi-Fi at your plant. Many of the organizations now are monitoring their internet connectivity and they actually issue fake certs out so that they can step in and do a man in the middle attack against SSL. Have you taken a look at preventing that type of activity? So there's two things. Uh, there is no Android or iOS app. So it's all native web, and I'm going to defer to Kevin. So it's based on it's, uh, it's a browser-based security. So right. encryption is actually browser-based encryption. Right. Um, how the system is developed, you would have to talk to our CTO. <laughs> but basically, because there's no application, it's encrypted in flight and at rest. Right. Currently at the state. I think I think I can transit maybe the question for you. Like, if you're using a corporate device, you're not guaranteed any of that browser-based security. So okay. how so how do people know not to use their company issued yeah. computer? So I'm using a corporate network, I can I do this for a living. So right. the web filter I one of the web filters I manage, if you're on my network, I can watch everything you oh, do yes. through SSL. So, right? nice. so if if you're using the corporate network to go report, I can you know, if I feel like I, I can, stamp and I can right, right, right. step in and. But the nice thing about this is, since you're not, you're not limited ge geographically or by time, so you can go home and do it from your network because you don't have to worry about them. And that's one of the things. That's why we want to have a native app. And Question up in the back. So we can set it up in different ways. Like for example, DTE has a compliance department internally. So any of the complaints that go, they go to the compliance department or the HR department. Um, there's other companies who do external investigations for these companies. And at that time, the company would give them access and them rights to see this as well. So it all depends on how they want to implement the tool. Question back here, Jeff. How are you uh, funding this? Uh, this is currently fund self-funded. What do we see as our main competition? Um, we've listed a few. I don't know if you guys can answer that. But uh, I think we're, we've looked, looked at other competition, but everybody makes you log in. And we're the only one that doesn't make you enter your credentials or any type of uh, information about yourself. So we haven't found anybody who's doing this type of technology, this type of process at a corporate level. Right. So on that point, how well are you guys protecting against that too? So for example, like Uber uh, sent out a bunch of deployments to uh, undercut Lyft. How do you do the same for this platform? I, I didn't uh, if, if anyone can log in and log out and whistleblow, uh -huh. how do you know that uh, some corporate saboteur isn't going to do that against their competitor? So uh, that is a good question, but what we've tried to do is uh, we have a CAPTCHA. I don't know if you guys can answer it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's based on code that's supplied by the company, and then 
you have to have this subjective name that you put in just to make sure that people aren't smashing random codes and brute forcing their way through the system. So, okay, so, so there's, some there's a code that all the employees get, yeah. and it's hopefully the same. That's probably the advertising. <laughs> and then so the code is being generated, are we planning on uh, the company itself? They can create timelines for regenerating the code. Other questions? Uh, so oh. It's not a secure drop. I mean, Secure Drop is open source. New York Times uses it. A lot of folks use it for, you know, accepting uh, private, you know, anonymous submissions. Um, yeah. It's been peer reviewed. And why, why would why would someone do something different? Uh, I think we we really designed this, and I don't know too much about Secure Drop. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll look it up. Okay. Question right behind Doug. Sorry, I didn't get you. Just looking away now. Any other questions? Do you have a question? Thank you. Uh, Right back there. In the last one. Are you trying to get into any government work, or do you purposely stay away from that? Uh, we've we've uh, thrown the idea of the SEC around. I got time for one more. That's for answer. Uh, what's your ask from this group? Other than this, well, I guess you gave me all your asks. Look at that. Like, um, okay, so you can ask for introductions to initial customers would probably the most important one there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Pictures are complete. Um, I have to take a quick picture of all of you. So if you're going to be at Pizza House tonight, throw your hand up. Because uh, Ben is going to go over and make sure that we got enough pies already cooking for everyone while we do our community <laughs> announcements here. All right, Ben Ramo picture, keep them up nice and high. Uh, all right, here we go. One, two, one. I swear this is the most efficient way to do this. Better than me counting. Okay, thank you. We're done with that. Um, so, community announcements. If you have an announcement, if you're hiring, if you're looking for talent, if you're looking for a job, if you have a meetup, it's all welcome. There's no filter here. You showed up, you came to all the pitches, you get to say your 30 seconds. So, uh, if you would line up along this wall right here, everyone will come down in front and we'll make the announcements. Come on down, we can pick us up. Please, please quiet down for uh, this last bit of announcements and there'll be plenty of time to talk after that. Thank you, Brian. My name is Barbara Bold. I'm a communication skills expert and I actually come to these things and um, take notes on everyone who speaks and then I give it to them afterwards. I look for possible clients for my workshops, which are called Pitch Polish, and I focus on delivery. So it's delivery of your message, making it clear, making it impactful, and if you are interested in what I do and love, would like to have a card, please come and see me. Thank you. Barbara's actually going to be, is this on? Yes, you can hear me. Barbara's going to be joining us. Oh, you know that I shut it down. Oh, you shut, shut it, down. it down. Come on, Yeah, Ryan. okay, just project. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my name's Ryan Gorley. Um, I run TechArm, which is the University of Michigan Student Venture Accelerator. Um, and I was saying Barbara's going to be joining us to uh, work with our teams to help them pitch uh, next month, so we're looking forward to that. Um, wanted to put a plug in for some mentor mixers that we're having over the next three weeks. Uh, we do these Mondays from 4 to 6. Uh, next week, uh, we have one that's focused on marketing, branding, and communication. So if you have expertise in that area and would like to lend it to uh, some university student entrepreneurs, uh, we'd appreciate you stopping by. Again, that's 4 to 6, and it's at Blue Tractor. We're at the bar. That's next Monday. Um, the following Monday, it's focused on product development. So if product development is your area of expertise and you'd like to lend that to university entrepreneurs, please come then. And then the following uh, Monday on August 7th, uh, it's focused on finance and fundraising. So if you have areas of expertise in any, if you have expertise in any of these areas, uh, we would love to see you then. And uh, I'm also going to leave up here a one-pager on our four companies. They're all here tonight. If you can raise your hands, guys. 
All right, so if you want to connect with them ahead of time, um, please do so, and more information is about, about them and the Mentor Mixers is up here. Thanks, guys. Good evening, everybody. So, oh, we're back, we're back. We're back. Uh, so my name is Dave Corcoran. Uh, uh, Brian and I work together at Third Rail. Uh, Brian and I have been spending this summer along with some other sponsors to bring a man named Paul Singh into town. So if you don't know Paul Singh, he's one of the early employees at America Online. He was a managing director at 500 Startups and he has decided a couple years ago that he's going to sell a lot of things and buy an Airstream trailer and travel all across the U.S. investing in startups. So why did he do that? because he saw all the frothy deals that were happening on the coast and he realized he wanted to invest in the Midwest and the best way to do that is to establish trust with businesses in those communities. So he comes and he's been to over 65 communities now. They travel, he and his limited partners will come into town. They're gonna to spend three days here from August 8th, 9th, and 10th. And we're gonna do events for investors. We're gonna do events for entrepreneurs. If you have a startup, I highly recommend you go to the website resultsjunkies.com. You'll see the Ann Arbor tour on there, and you can sign up for office hours with Paul. Paul tries to invest in every community that he goes into, and he's invested in hundreds of startups. That is his model. So I hope you guys can make it out for that. Right up on the board. You got it. There's a piece of paper, limited quantity here, <laughs> if you want to uh, grab it on the way out. Let me see events going on that week. So I'm back, um, you know, we're launching Safe Whistle, so I do have a day job. Um, in the day, I run an electronics manufacturing company, and part of that, I announced it last time, but uh, we're launching a meetup group or a networking group called Electronics Development and Manufacturing. Electronics has really taken off right now. Um, there's, the, there's, everybody knows IoT, and there's a bridge between the real world and uh, software, so we want to create that community, kind of let everybody know how to develop, electronics, how to manufacture them, and what the latest trends are. Also, we have people uh, pitching their electronics product here, so there's a person in this room who's going to be pitching, pitching next time. Um, and then, also, my wife and my kids are launching a school called Acton Academy, and uh, it's a very entrepreneurial-based school. They use adaptive learning software rather than teachers teaching. And one of the unique things is that every year from the first grade, the kids are taught how to launch a business, and they have a business fair at the end of the year as a final project. So they set up a booth, they set up a product, they create their marketing plan, price points, and they launch their businesses. So if you guys are interested in that, we have some uh, brochures up here. Hi, my name is Scott Gosey, and I got a couple of meetups, so I'm gonna go through them pretty fast. First, if you like the startups that you saw today and you want to learn how to build some of your own, I'm co-organizer of one of the groups called Coffee House Coders here in Ann Arbor. We'd love to help teach you to build the startups of tomorrow. Thank you. All right. Validation. Um, secondly, if you're looking for a co-working space, uh, the Tech Brewery is, has a long tradition of helping startups kind of build their teams up as a co-working space. Come check us out. Uh, if your community needs a job board, uh, me and Mike run a startup called True Job in town that can help you get more impact with your community. And finally, what we're most excited about is there's an A2 Brew Tech coming up uh, August 9th, which is the Paul Singh A2 Brew Tech. So it's going to be at Dominic's, there's going to be Sangria, there's going to be some concert buzzes, and it's going to be fun. So res uh, reserve today, it's on the same meetup page as A2 New Tech, there'll be the next one posted. So <laughs> cheers and thanks. We're the team behind Safe Whistle um, and, and also Side Pitch from last month's pitch. Uh, so basically we're looking for senior developers that are interested in blockchain technologies or SaaS platforms. Um, any developers on front end as well, uh, basically integrating UI, UX with applications on the back end, as well as um, designers uh, for applications. And so talk to me after if you guys are looking for a job in those fields. Groups. One at the Ross School of Business, we have a Toastmasters group and we teach leadership, sales, building self confidence, presentations. We do have some free leadership training upcoming in up in about two weeks. 
And I also am starting a Toastmasters club at Sweetwaters in downtown Ann Arbor. We are looking for people to be on the executive board. So if you're interested in learning about being on the board and also learning all the other things that come along with Toastmasters, please see Ann Arbor area Toastmasters meetup. Thank you. Either at Umish uh, or Gmail. And uh, I am currently a uh, research scientist at University of Michigan studying um, vision and uh, neural circuitry in the retina. I love technology. I love talking about education. I love talking about biology and how we can merge a lot of different areas of life together and make people happier. and. Uh, if you have any interest in technology or biology or education or all sorts of things, please look me up. Um, I love meeting new people and having great conversations. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Bill Rusnak and I say any publicity is good publicity, so I came up to say hi. Um, and so uh, I've just been uh, working on a whole bunch of different Python projects recently, and so if you're really interested in programming and doing some cooler things, uh, let me know. Hi, I'm Doug, uh, CEO of Duo Security. So uh, we have a monthly talk series called Duo Tech Talks. If you go look at meetup.com and find it. Um, the next one is on August 11th, where uh, my best man, uh, Niels Provost, uh, he's head of Google Security and Privacy, uh, and all of it, is giving a talk uh, at our offices in downtown Ann Arbor on what Google has done in terms of their infrastructure security since the Operation Aurora attacks of 2009, when the Chinese basically breached them, as well as Yahoo, as well as Dow Chemical and pretty much uh, everybody else. And so, uh, yeah, they're giving, he's giving me a, a great talk actually about a lot of uh, the internals of Google security. It won't be broadcast, it won't be recorded in like all of our other talk tech, talk tech talks. If you want to hear more about that, you got to be there because we'll be covering a bunch of other stuff, including how they keep the NSA out. So, uh, that'll be an interesting talk on August 11th, 6 p.m. at Duo. Sweet. All right, uh, that's a wrap. Thank you all for coming out to July's A2 New Tech. We'll be back here in August, Tuesday, August 15th. Both uh, August and September are spoken for as far as pitches go. You have to hear from all the TechArb companies. You saw Ryan earlier. Uh, TechArb is a student accelerator. All of those current cohort will be pitching on August 15th. And then in October, you get to hear from Desai Accelerator, which is another uh, not student or anything specific, but an Ann Arbor-based uh, tech accelerator. So that will be September. If you want to pitch or know somebody that might in October or later, organizers at a2newtech.org. And I hope to see you at the Pizza House. It's 618 Church Street. When you walk in, go up the stairs, we're in the maze and blue room. And uh, thanks everyone for coming out. Cheers.